it would be difficult to compare all various sets of yet and new things. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thanks so much for joining us today. This is uh, the second day of our degree show, the MA Research Architecture cohort at the Center for Research Architecture. Um, so the second day, it's second panel. It's about borders. It's called At the Border, Hostile Thresholds. And um, so the three of us are three MA students who are graduating this year, presenting some of our work on and around borders, technology, and kind of the way that the borders extended. Um, and we have three guest respondents and speakers today. So we have Lorenzo Pisani, who's a lecturer in forensic architecture at the Centre for Research Architecture. Dr. Luca Neuronia, who is um, a lecturer at the Sarah Parker Riemann Centre at UCL, and Thomas Percival, who is a PhD at the Centre for Research Architecture. Um, so I think we're just going to start with really brief presentations from the three of us, just to kind of introduce and contextualise our work, and then we're going to get into responses and like a broad discussion around borders today and how our work kind of intersects with each other's and some of yours. Cool. <laughs> So I guess I'll get started. So the way it's going to go is each of us is going to present one text, one research process, and one outcome. Broadly speaking, it was like a loose schema that we used to kind of make sure we weren't talking for too long, essentially. But um, sorry, it's right here. <laughs> right um, so the text that I thought was formative to my research and the way that I conducted my research this year, which is about immigration databases in the UK, um, is David Graeber's Dead Zones of the Imagination, which is a text about bureaucracy and the way that it's manifested. What I found really helpful and useful about this text wasn't the way that it kind of schematized bureaucracy or made it really kind of easy to understand, but I found it really helpful in thinking about how bureaucracy is fundamentally co connected to issues of structural violence, um, not just within specific states, but kind of more broadly. And so that was really helpful for me in terms of conceptualizing and thinking through some of the issues that I was facing with my own research. So my own research around databases is quite hard to pin down, and I found it quite difficult at certain times to really put it into a framework of understanding it, and this text proved very formative for doing that. Um, so these are screenshots of databases that I produced myself as part of my research process. So one thing that came up a lot as I was conducting my research was that actually understanding the nature of how immigration databases in the UK work was quite difficult, not just for people who find themselves on the receiving end of it, but also for organisations and people who find themselves having to deal with them a lot in the course of their work. So this was you know, kind of screenshots of some databases that I put together to try and understand the process for myself. So on the right you can see a database of different documents, procurements, briefings, internal reports, news coverage around these specific immigration databases. I chose to focus on a biometrics database just because I thought it was a useful way of thinking about how the border is spatialized. And this one is basically a database of ind the independent chief inspector of borders and immigration reports. So it was a way of thinking through how um, even people within or people who work within the systems of the Home Office conceptualize and think about what the Home Office's functions are over time and with respect to specific things that the Home Office can do. Um, and this, we can just go through it briefly, this is a website that I put together at the end of my MA as part of one of the assessments, which is called the Investigative Report. If you go to the next slide. Um, so it's a website that I put together essentially for anyone who wants to understand more about how immigration databases work in the UK. So my hope is that it can be kind of a research tool for people who are already kind of invested in this work. Some of the people that I spoke to throughout my research said that it would be helpful to have somewhere to kind of understand where every database, like what it's called and like what it actually does get to the next slide. Um, and so that's kind of a screenshot or an overview of some of the different things I produced, which is essentially like a counter mapping exercise and understanding how these databases are like produced materially. So what private companies are involved in them, what different kind of ways that they interact with or actually uphold the border regime and actually make profit from it. Yeah. Cool. Oh yeah, and that's a database of databases. Um, and this was, uh, kind of graphic I put together to try and understand how these databases are linked to each other or theoretically linked to each other. Um, so my research evolves around the European Border and Coast Guard Agency, Frontex, which is one of the biggest EU agencies. They are funded with like over 500 million euros this year. And um, I'm looking into how they increase the area of surveillance and at the same time retreated their naval assets from the Mediterranean and um, yeah, how these cases are connected to interceptions in the Mediterranean. 
One text that was really important for my research was for politics of atmospheric governance and um, the term atmospheric policing, policing, which is termed by Anna Feigenbaum and Anja Kangieser, and they say that those technologies and techniques for controlling populations that are fundamentally predicated on their relationship with air and that colonize space in a way other weapons do not. So I kind of use this term atmospheric policing to talk about um, area surveillance in the Mediterranean. And this is part of my process. So what I tried to do was like mapping um, different aircrafts in the Mediterranean on top of each other. And I did that by hand with Illustrator. So this is how it looked like um, during my process. And in the end, like for my outcome, I tried to uh, automate that basically. And I made a website that is mapping, that using a data set that is mapping all these sites on top of each other. So you can browse through different years on a timeline. And it shows all the data sets that are available mapped between 2018 and now. Oh, and there's, and there's another part, which is called stories that kind of connects different cases of aerial to, uh, area surveillance to pullbacks to Libya. So kind of, I made an archive of all incidents that um, mentioned a plane during an interception. And the stories are kind of this, have this idea of like connecting cases to um, tracks of aircraft. <laughs> um, so I'm, I was also doing the same masters but in a different studio, the research architecture studio, and my research title was Technologies of the Immigration Bail Hearing, um, Incarceration and Deportation Through Everyday Law. Um, so basically over the past year and a half, I've, well kind of two years now actually, I've been observing the immigration bail hearing um, in the UK, which is a legal event that occurs when people who are detained on the immigration powers apply for bail in order to continue their struggle for immigration status outside the space of incarceration. Um, and I've kind of been investigating how the technology is used through immigration bail hearings um, expedite the system of incarceration and deportation and scrutinizing it to examine the kind of wider infrastructures around the law that are also operating in the production of legal decision making. Um, so, next slide. So, I've effectively been conducting a legal ethnography over um, two courts, like building a huge amount of court observations. With This is Taylor House in Clerkenwell, and then the next one is um, Hatton Cross in uh, Heathrow um, and I kind of I entered through the lens of technology um, where before the pandemic the majority of bell hearings were held by video link and then I mean there was some physical but basically mo 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 sorry, mainly video link and then post pandemic they all moved to the telephone and so um, sorry next slide yeah the legal transmission in both cases is the technology and my spatial condition is um, the kind of phone line or screen that the courtroom is effectively collapsed to. Um, and the method kind of came out of the constraints from court. So recording is prohibited even if it's on the phone. And this kind of developed a practice of analog recordings through drawing and transcribing. Um, next slide. Yeah. So my position during this period of research kind of expanded, which I think is quite interesting maybe to talk about later with all of our work, but it expanded physically and conceptually, where firstly physically moving from being in the courtroom to the telephone altered my kind of mode of access and listening. And secondly, conceptually, where through extensive observation and kind of building this ethnography, it moved from initially like a more experiential experience to a more analytical as I kind of accumulated and developed this like wider knowledge of bail through con conversations with loads of legal practitioners and just constantly like noticing the same patterns over and over again. Um, so that kind of leads me on to my key text which is alongside many other texts including your book Luke which was <laughs> really big in my work but 
um, Nadine Al Nani wrote a book called Bordering Britain that effectively she argues how British immigration law is an ongoing expression of empire and um, she argues how the ongoing colonial project is legitimized through judicial rulings in immigration and asylum cases. And um, the main thing that I really got from this was how to conceptualize the hearing through her kind of idea of immigration time. Um, this is meant to be a animation, but it's, it's like a screenshot. But basically, um, I, it kind of helped me conceptualize how the bail hearing becomes a pivot to further incarceration and deportation in a wider timeline of these individual trajectories that are precarious, fragmented, cyclical, where the bail hearing is often the moment of reset. And Nadine talks about the need for recognition, which creates a reality where individuals facing the system find themselves legally rebuffed again and again. She quotes Sarah Keenan when talking about the racialized body in immigration time, explaining how borders' attachment to racialized people means they carry with them a space of disproportionate vulnerability to violence and premature death. And um, using Ruth Wilson Gilmore's definition of racism, which thinks about race as a temporal category in relation to survival, she writes, the lives and futures of those without a right of entry and stay are made precarious and contingent, and people without a legal status come to occupy, to borrow from Saeed, a time that is over. And like this, yeah, I think this really kind of, when I started to get my head around this, it really like was a pivot in my research because the notion of the immigration time helped me as a lens to kind of express the significance of the supposed insignificance of bail and how this notion of like everyday law um, forms, it became a key, a key like theoretical stem in my work. And um, the technology in the hearing kind of comes out of this everydayness or the supposed insignificance of it. And I just finished on a quote by another legal anthropologist called Sonal Makija who states, despite this, the power and control that everyday law yields in their lives as they stand before it, and the submission to this ordinary law with a small L spirals their lives out of control. So I feel like that kind of all ties together. Um, and yeah, I think we can lead on now. Yeah. Yeah. And so we thought we'd start with like a broad question and then maybe just kind of move into a discussion. Um, so the question that we came up with together, particularly because of the title of the panel, was how do we work around or within the concept of the hostile threshold? So not just as a site or a border or something that's spatialized, but also as a part or a deterrent in research processes. <laughs> I'm happy to start with some thoughts. Uh, um, and actually, so if you allow me, I'll, maybe, I'll, I'll try to get to your question, but through a, you know, maybe a slightly winding road. Um, insofar as, you know, when I was you know, preparing a bit for this panel, looking again in your work, um, what struck me there, you know, thinking about the three projects together, uh, was perhaps not so much the idea of the threshold itself, but more the encounter, which is you know the other <laughs> kind of concept you know that that is mobilized by the show now. Um, insofar as you know, I think each of your projects like asks this question: What is an encounter, right? And you know, this seems like a very banal question, right? But in fact, I think it's it's an extremely politically important and and you know, philosophically very difficult to grasp one as well, right? Um, you know, in your case, Giovanna, the encounter is, of course, you know, between a plane and a boat, right? And the question of, like, what is an encounter, it's key there, right? Insofar as, you know, how, let's say, the ways that Frontes gets off the hook, like, with the responsibility to rescue, is to say, well, there is no, you know, the fact that we are sighting from the air, doesn't like you know put on us any responsibility, right? So you know they kind of denying they are encountering migrants at that point. They're saying you know we're just surveying from far away. There's no kind of communication, no encounter. You know we just leave, and and you know we leave them there, right? 
in your case, Woodren, obviously the encounter is also problematized and made difficult by technology, right? It's, you know, it's through media and through different technologies. These encounters are complicated and made difficult or impossible on many levels. In your case, Sanj, you know, the encounter is an encounter between data and policing in a sense, right? So let's say the experience of people, the lives of people is, is kind of reduced to data points and those data points kind of, you know, give certain outputs which, you know, in the in the view of the home office are meant to yeah, facilitate deportation and so on and so forth, right? So, you know, there's really like something quite extraordinary happening there. And and I find, you know, one of the people I have the pleasure to collaborate with in some of my projects, Ita Marman, is a legal scholar, has written a whole book, you know, from a legal perspective, let's say, about, you know, rethinking human rights law uh, as this question of the encounter, you know, what is an encounter and what kind of duties and responsibilities, rights and responsibilities, you know, are bestowed onto us at the moment in which we encounter, you know, somebody else, basically, right? Um, and it seems to me like the brilliant thing about all of your projects is that you are refusing like a very easy way to understand this, right? Which is often how power understands this kind of misencounters, right? Which is to say, well, uh, you know, uh, the problem is just about the mediation, right? There's something wrong happening like in between things, right? You know, it's just like a question of like the, the phone line which is not good enough, you know, if only we could have more bandwidth, you know, like then, you know, Bay earrings would work perfectly, right? Or, you know, Frontex like, yeah, if only we could go down a little bit more with the plane, you know, it would work, or, you know, all of these things, right? And I think refusing that, you know, kind of like technological fix is like, you know, paramount to kind of your, the way in which you're, you know, framing and taking a also a political position in relation to that, right? And saying, well, no, of course, every encounter is always mediated, right? There's no such a thing as a non-mediated encounter, right? Even if we, when we meet like two people, you know, it's it's always there is always a process of mediation, right? And so that kind of shifts the question, and then you know the question that you are asking instead is, you know, what is the power relations that get enforced, reproduced, or, or, you know, modified through this encounter, right? And that seems to me, yeah, a fundamental way of kind of reconfig reconfiguring those questions, right? And, and kind of stopping away from the idea that, yes, we could, you know, fix it to asking instead, how can we, you know, resist it, like overturn it, or, or you know, how can we at least kind of detect, let's say, the power relations that are, you know, happening in all those encounters, right? And so this leads me back to your question, because, you know, of course, you as researchers or, or you know, or, or through the proxies also, like in your case, Giovanna, you know, like the, the, you know, the search and rescue NGOs who do the kind of, you know, uh, um, sightings themselves, you know, um, you are yourself like part of that encounter and part of that mediation to a certain extent, right? You are, you know, other mediators within that story, right? And that kind of, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't have like kind of a grand finale, but like, you know, it just, I think it's, it just begs the question of like, you know, what is the kind of ethical political stance that, you know, one as a researcher within those contexts can and, and should have, right? And, and, you know, one needs to be acutely aware of that position, I guess, in order to be able to, you know, somehow, uh, yeah, kind of operate within that context, right? Within, without having the illusion that we are kind of external to it, right? Um, so yeah, maybe just this as a as a first kind of response. Yeah, I can build on a little bit of that. Um, firstly, maybe to state something quite obvious, but the thing I really enjoyed uh, looking at this stuff today before I came, um, looking at the things you sent, the videos in, in full and the websites. And I think the thing from someone who comes not from this field, someone who thinks about the politics of immigration and kind of came through social science studies of migration, the tendency is to focus primarily on kind of nasty statements from people like Priti Patel, um, language, discourse, to analyse the discourse of in, in the media to, to kind of actually overemphasise in some ways the importance of political pronouncements about what the next thing is. Um, whether that's 
you know, just the language of hostile environment being a problem, or um, the language of analysing metaphors, etc. All of which is really important and is not disconnected from what you you guys are doing and talking about. But what I think is especially valuable about all three of these projects is to really help us see how these systems work and systems that are deliberately difficult to um, to to see to observe. I mean, bail hearings. The only you spoke to some of the people I know. But the, where I get my information is from lawyers and from, from bail for immigration detainees about the kind of farce that if people knew about you would expect might change the ways they understood what, what immigration and board, immigration control and borders do. And I thought your use of Nadine's work was great. I'm going to send her a text to say <laughs> that, that you, um, you were so, so, so found her work so useful. She'll be chuffed with that. Um, and then similarly with, this, with the stuff on on Frontex, I, I found the video quite affecting the kind of sensory experience of seeing all of that sea and that small boat and then a much more advanced militarised boat come towards it. I think that a lot of us know that stuff happens in the Med. A lot of us know that there's some humanitarians and, and we have a sense of it, but I think to visualise, see and realise um, both the kind of systems of aerial surveillance and then the much lower tech forms of people trying to cross in dinghies, basically, to see that and not in a kind of just the most abject versions that we've seen in the, in the mainstream media was really powerful for me and helped me think about um, watching the watches, I suppose, and trying to work out how their technologies and their new kind of systems uh, work to prevent basically any human connection through humanitarian care and saving people from the water. And then um, I really like the, the database from, from you, Sam. The database map is a great resource. I'm going to send it to my friend who I'm writing a book with about border abolition and we've been talking about tech and databases. We have a chapter on the database state and I wish I'd uh, seen this website before I handed in the manuscript. <laughs> um, but I think it's really important because one of the points that I came to realise only very late in that project of writing that chapter together with Gracie was that I think again this is about visualising the things that are hard to visualise or making them making us see what how these systems work is that I think when we talk about tech and borders we think about Drones, facial recognition, um, body scanners, you know, new forms of voice printing, all this scary, terrifying, new biometrics, um, totalizing surveillance. But one of the, the things I've got from kind of reading a bit about Bertillon, the French um, kind of police, you know, thinker of police science and using uh, anthrop anthropometry to measure bodies, was that the challenge for him was not just which bits of the body can we measure so that we can tell one person from another. It was how do you store all that information and then get it out. How do you how do you basically manage data? And that was always in some ways the more challenging thing than the fingerprint or whatever. Um, and I think by focusing on databases, thinking about the move from paper to digital, thinking about interoperability um, is stuff that's very new to me. The fact that you're, you're kind of approaching the border from that at this level I think it bodes well and is really important because, again, this comes back to the broader point, a lot of the ways people think about migration and even become critical of borders still remains largely, can remain largely at a more superficial level. But what are people saying about these people? Is this person nastier than this person? Tory bashing and not realising the history of um, policies or kind of consensus across political lines around certain policies and infrastructures. I think when you kind of trace the history of databases, you have a different way in. And then we can use that, I think I will use that, to kind of um, complement a wider critique of racist discourse. Racist, um, and I suppose broadly just to, um, to end, I think the emphasis on, um, on I suppose on, on practice, the big question that remains for me is on whether these things fail uh, sometimes we have a tendency to kind of think that they're going to succeed and take over and be all totalizing. There's a challenge I always find, both in thinking about what's new about these systems and what's continuous, but also thinking about what to make of when they fail politically, um, whether to see that as a sign that it'll never work and therefore, you know, we need to, um, we can use that as a ground to argue for getting rid of them all together, or whether these are kind of um, stepping stones on the way to something that will work more successfully, which is the big question about digitization, about bail hearings that are kind of terror, you know, the, the phone where you can't even hear yourself is an example of it not working, but will we get to a point where perhaps 
they do work, and, and it's hard to predict the future, but we guess we have to act with both possibilities of their ongoing failure and then getting more efficient in mind. And yeah, thanks, I learned a lot from the project. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentations today. Um, I was kind of surprised that you invited me to the panel because you probably heard everything I already have to say on these <laughs> projects over the last year, but I was really happy to, to try and think about the three of them together. And, and I think Luke's point um, is really important in that the projects in some way all investigate what we might mean by the border or a hostile threshold, right? But, but sort of turn their back on what we normally think of it as and look at the way in which it is multiplied and infected through all of these other kinds of mechanisms, right? And I think, um, and then you get at something that is, as you said, like impossible to see in some way, right? And I think what's been most impressive for me seeing the projects is the sort of like inventiveness of methods that you've developed to look at something that's really hard to see and really hard to understand, right? And it's, um, and you go through the show and you see it everywhere, but you see like that it's a combination of like, you know, ethnography, of drawing, of doing videos, of mapping something through like, you know, an illustration, but it's also FOI requests and it's talking to people, you know, and I think um, these systems that you're looking at are purposefully challenging to investigate, right? That they're designed to be in some way obfuscating of the kind of like critical gaze. And what for me has been so nice is to see the ways that you're sort of always trying to get at the thing and trying to put together a picture of often really complicated bureaucratic structures or like really difficult things to like map and understand. Um, and not just to like understand them, but then to really articulate the particular kinds of like violences um, that have been produced by that. And I think it's, I mean, I've just been, it's been great to see. Um, for me, the question of like what's new and what's continuous, I think, is also really important because, I, you know, the other thing that you all refuse to do is to say that like this is the problem, therefore we need the solution to it, right? And I think in Woodrin's video, there's a bit where you quote um, Nadine's book where she says, uh, and you say in the video that even if we were to fix the like the problematic tech, the problematic encounter that's produced through this mediated mode of engagement, right? The unethical mediated engagement. Even if we was to resolve that, we're still talking about a system that is structurally unjust, right? Mm -hmm. That like uh, the immigration system is structurally unjust. So you're you're all doing this kind of work in the project that I really think is like so worthwhile. Where it's it's both looking at the particular. Um, kind of encounter that's happening now, right? Whether it's through like satellite images uh, or, and drone images, sorry, of like uh, the MED, or whether it's through the sort of like, yeah, development of new technical modes of bureaucracy, or whether it's through a sort of like mediated encounter. Um, and you're digging into those as case studies in order to show the kind of violences, the particular violences, but without ever letting go of the sort of like underlying project and I think that's for me where it's been so great to see and, it, and there was a point this morning in the in the panel when the question of abolition came up I think Shella mentioned it and I think that's where that's where these projects I think always hold on to that kind of um, political force at the same time as wanting to be like here, here look at this example look at this particular kind of like uh, insistence of these things but anyway, just <laughs> Um, I think we had a couple of specific questions. I don't know if one of us wants to start as well. Thank you, obviously, for those responses as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, yeah, thank you so much for those responses. I feel like it's so nice to um, hear, like, I don't know, hear, hear the work being spoken about back to you. Like, it still is so helpful. Like, every time I hear my, work things go back to me, I'm like, okay, there's like this new thing that I could go down. But um, I guess thinking about method, which for all of us is slightly different, but um, you mentioned, I think Thomas or maybe Lorenzo mentioned about um, things that are hard to visualize. And um, that I feel like slightly in a tangential way also is 
um, goes into the methods around like a access and like restricted access and how to kind of go around that, but then also also the ethics around that. And for me, I guess I was interested, Luke, about maybe you expanding on your um, ethnographic methods and like I know with your book Deporting Black Britons, you talk really interestingly about how it kind of stems from this like huge care and time taken to build these relationships who with people who effectively I guess are your research subjects but the relationships and trust and care comes first and that's really fascinating because I think for me particularly like with with my work those relationships can never be built purely because of the lens of how I was accessing the kind of immigration system which is through this barrier of the courtroom effectively and trying to like amplify the voices of people that I can never really speak to um, and I feel like that's yeah it's interesting to think about I mean they're totally different methods but I would love to hear you talk more about that and and also I think it kind of relates to both of your practices as well in that way of um, yeah, when relationships can't be built mm -hmm. and the ethics and methods around that. Yeah, shall I go on that? <laughs> yeah. um, that's, that's a really good set of questions. I mean, I don't want to get too lost in ethical questions around ethnography because yeah. that's a whole area of discussion that is maybe too tangential to this. But I think, I suppose, um, for me, as I've thought about borders and what they do to people, there's obviously one line which would be that you continue the violence by subjecting people to an interview form which is just too similar to the home office there's a you know you're trying I, I describe my method or my a method of writing I suppose as portraiture which you could argue again has a kind of you know making visible making trying to make everyone legible but if you take that to the other extreme then um, then there's no point in ever trying to represent people's lives or talk to people and listen mm -hmm. to them. And that's why I think my attempt at a get out, as you point out, is to say something about political commitment and ethical care and then hopefully it's all all right. But part of that is because <laughs> um, I suppose for me, the, the I guess the link with things that are hard to see is I was speaking to people after they've been deported. And if you speak to people in the migrant sector here, Probably the reason people like Beard, who are one of my favourite organisations, Bail for Immigration Data Detainees, who you work with, who helped me a lot at different points. Um, lawyers who try, who, who, decent lawyers basically, and activists. The deportation happens and then a person is vanished um, and the state disappears then and you might try and keep contact, but actually most of the time you don't. So I think there's something quite deliberate about, about other people before me who did post-deportation work which was trying to say, uh, this isn't the end, although in legal terms for the state, it is, someone, it is them washing their hands of someone, it's the final realisation of illegality through expulsion. Um, it's a kind of modern form of banishment and it involves family separation and, and it's one of the most extraordinary forms of punishment you could imagine. So I think then it felt appropriate to me to go back to a kind of, you know, let's you say the words ethical care and political commitment and then tell people's stories I suppose um, and seeing that as valuable for some projects where for others it isn't. Um, I think that your creativity with methods is great for trying to get around a lot of problems about things that also are visible and I know from being involved in and speaking to students at undergraduate and master's level that sometimes there's a reflex to want to just interview people straight away, especially, and this is across all social sciences, but, you know, to want to know, I want to know about things, so I'll, I'll just interview someone, um, as though they can verify the thing for you, you'll have a little snippet of their voice, and then um, it was all worth it, you proved something, and that, you have to encourage people to think, does that make sense for the questions that you have, and maybe we can think about other things, they might be archival. And for me, they only end up normally in a 10,000 word dissertation. But for you guys, they've ended up in a whole different area of, um, of the method being in the telling and in the experimenting, exactly as he describes in a way better than I can. Um, but mapping, visualizing, making websites, drawing, um, recording, and making those videos. So that's something I really appreciate. I think in all questions of method and ethics, you have to think about what's right for the project itself mm -hmm. and not rush to try and show the people unless you have a pretty good reason. And I think 
ethical care and political commitment is a shorthand, my shorthand for that in the context of deportation, but um, but it doesn't work for everything. So, Jack, okay. Um, I think what I would be interested to know, or what like a problem that I encountered during my research, was like a techno threshold. So basically, sometimes like the data set wasn't complete, mm -hmm. and sometimes I would like find a track and it like stops in the middle of the ocean, which is like just this impossibility because the curvature of the Earth like kind of prevents the signals from coming through. So. I'm not quite sure how to like integrate that in the work, I think, because it stands there and you have this map and it like seems like this complete picture, but it's not. So I'm kind of thinking about like, yeah, how can we approach the unsensible and how can we integrate it as well in some sort of ways? Maybe whoever wants to. That's a question for an architect. <laughs> <laughs> Am I the only architect? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, go, go. Um, it's not particularly profound, but I think um, one of the things that I think happens a lot is how the state articulates its technological prowess as sort of totalizing, and that gets reproduced a lot in the critical literature, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, I mean, I read, like, surveillance studies a lot, and within that, there is just a sort of like rearticulation of the state's image of the total panopticon, right? Without actually understanding the shittiness of a lot of the systems, their failures. Um, and I think, you know, as researchers, we don't want to um, reproduce a kind of like, not only the image of the state, but also the image of our own set of methods as, you know, complete bold. And, um, and I think it's important then to sort of mark mark those technical incapacities in some way or like those fractures because they are part of the process, they're part of what's happening and they're part of how, for instance, sensing is happening both in terms of like Frontex possibilities of sensing but also who, who can counter map fr uh, Frontex too, right? So there's this, this, I think, important condition that needs to be always recognized because otherwise it does reproduce some kind of state uh, notion of, yeah. Which, which resonates as well with what you were saying, Luke, earlier, right? Of the yeah necessity to uh, yeah. I guess the question is always, let's say, you know, there is this idea that the, there's a way in which the technology works or doesn't work, right? And and uh, and the way in which it works, it's often assumed to be the way in which the company that produces it says it will work, right? And often, what you find also in, a, in quite a lot of critical literature is, you know, like you see like press releases by these, you know, huge, you know, kind of surveillance companies being taken for true, right? And just like assuming that they work in that way, right? But yeah, I think it's much more important and difficult as well, you know to see what these technologies actually do and produce, right, with their non-working, right, with, you know, with the, with the gaps or with the problems that they produce themselves, right? And, and that seems to me like, you know, kind of, you know, maybe it's a more imminent kind of plane of, of inquiry, but it's one that I find a lot more productive, right? Like, yeah, as you were saying, like going from the discourse, let's say what people say they will do or what people say technology will do to actually seeing how it operates in the world, right? How people are affected by it on different levels. Also, to a certain extent, unexpected from, you know, from what the technology company itself, like, thought, you know, might be produced there. So that's, you know, opens up an, a, a sp kind of gray space of, like, you know, which can be very bad, you know, kind of a space or arbitrariness or, like, where power can be even more ruthless, but also perhaps space of, you know, escape, right, of kind of, you know, where you can, you know, a fugitive kind of space, right, where the, the, the grip of the technology itself can be, uh, uh, you know, resisted and, and uh, yeah, kind of escape. And if I can maybe just add one thing, because what you both said, you know, kind of prompted me to think about this, um, you know, the question of, of proximity and distance in our gaze, right, which connects both your question in a sense, 
and uh, I, I very much like what you said, Luke, in terms of you know thinking about this kind of let's say closer ethnographic look, you know, as something that can work in certain situations, but it's certainly not the solution, right? And and you know there is often this yeah uh, assumption that yeah we just need to get a bit closer, right? We just need to get, you know to see a little bit better, and then things will be fine, you know. But in fact, it, that's not the case. And uh, I mean, in, in my own work on the Mediterranean, we have encountered this. You know, looking at how you know when we started our work, uh, you know, like the first project we did on the Left to Die boat, you know, we we're working mainly with remote sensing means, right, with satellite imagery, you know, with vessel tracking, etc. Because there were witnesses there, you know, there wasn't, you know, people uh, uh, that we could speak to, right, that that were present, you know, to in the fact. And that demanded that you know we use this kind of remote means of investigation. Then you know after 2015, when the NGOs started to you know conduct also search and rescue themselves, and you know came to the sea equipped with a lot of like GoPro cameras and you know photo cameras, etc., we were kind of flooded by you know hours and hours of footage, right? So we we went from no image to like an excess of image, right? And then you know the critical task there. Was how to assemble, you know, this multitude of material in a way that, yeah, made sense and and that, you know, was part of like a, a certain kind of struggle. And but that posed also other problems, right? Because we suddenly started to, you know, work with images where you see, you know, black and brown bodies in very kind of vulnerable conditions. You know, people that you don't have access to as well. You know, you cannot go and meet them and and you know have a conversation about what would be a kind of ethical use of those images, right? Either because they are being brought back to Libya or because they die at sea sometimes. And and you know, that really forced us to to think very carefully about what we would do with those images, right? What was, you know, the kind of a way to 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 engage with those that would not reproduce, let's say, this kind of also imaginary of like, you know, bestiality or what the, you know, kind of let's say all the kind of racist Imaginary that the border is made of as well, right? Um, so just to say, I mean, yeah, I guess the question is never one. There's no, let's say, one fits all solution, right? It's not that we either need to go more distant or more close, but it's always one of kind of careful positioning, right? And interrogating one's position constantly within, you know, the the whole process, right? It's not that once that you decide for something, it works forever, but it constantly need to be. Rearranged, re, you know, and and uh, and rethought. Um, I think I'm not sure how much time we've got left, but I've got one question, and then maybe we can open up some questions from the audience if we've got the time. Um, but this is—I'm not entirely sure how to articulate this, but I'm going to do my best. Um, but something that came up a lot in the research that I think all of us have been doing, and something that came up a lot for me as well, was that like there is often this not like a competing goal, but sometimes there is this thing of like, you know, my personal beliefs or the beliefs that were like espoused by the work of like border abolition and like these kind of things that you feel really strongly and that come out of the conversations you're having and things that you're reading and like the work that you're producing and also like the realities of how cruel and violent border regimes are now. And so how to not argue just for like fixes to those to make them like marginally less cruel for people. And that was something that came up in some of the interviews I did with people who work at like organizations like Liberty and things who like produce legal challenges. And so I think, I'm going to try and articulate it now, but how do you kind of hold those two mm -hmm. things in one? I think like Moten and Harney talk about this as well, right? Like working within an institution and outside of an institution, mm -hmm. like together. But how do you hold the two as a researcher kind of together? And how do you like, I guess, is, is it a question of like giving more weighting to one depending on the forum you're in? Is it a question of like, thinking through both of them together and seeing what fits that moment or like the, the research method. But that was something that I think came up for us quite a lot throughout our research and I'm sure has come up for, for you three as well. So mm -hmm. I was kind of curious about how you navigated that and like what what things you might also do differently, I guess, if you're mm -hmm. continuing to engage with those questions. Big question. Can we have a go? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, one response is to kind of it feels like a rehearsal now because I feel like we all talk about abolition more, which is great. Um, but it's to think about non reformist reforms, to think about um, strategically raising questions about what kinds of reforms to bits of the border regime 
um, would ultimately work towards its dismantling rather than its reproduction or rather than kind of prolonging it in a different way and I think this is where for some of the people you spoke to you probably might diverge from them if you want to pursue and transpose the kinds of theories of prison and police abolition from the US context primarily to borders here you probably would need to think about people who work in the migrant and legal sector and what their um, professional kinds of common senses mean for what they imagine is possible and what timelines they work to and that's true also of uh, funded NGOs and etc when you think about what kinds of moves they make um, so for example in context of bail and immigration detention there might be let's somehow make the courtroom work again as though it could ever work um, under this particular set of laws and policies um, it might mean um, alternatives to detention which involve tagging which has been a standard um, demand well one of the parts of the suggested alternatives to detention has been community monitoring but you know again a tech fix of a kind of everywhere surveillance um, not enough talk between people who work on detention and deportation because obviously the problem with reducing the detention estate is that only works if you don't then expedite the deportation machine which is partly what the Home Office pre-COVID seemed to be trying to do. One hostile environment, make everyone self-deport by make, denying them access to the means of life everywhere they go including the university, um, making it impossible to live, access a bank account open a driving license, uh, open a bank account, get a driving license, you know, rent a house um, so that people will self-deport and then also have these kinds of removal windows which is a way of trying to um, basically say at any point in the, at this time if you don't reply to the letter successfully then you can be removed at any point and then you can have immigration raids etc. So there's things I think that can happen when people don't talk to each other and why I suppose abolition is the more radical position starting point being a more radical position can help us connect those things and think about the deportation corridor and different points at which we might intervene I think we've seen a lot of people involved in direct action try to do that while also having quite savvy um, media campaigns like the Stansted 15 and also Reclaim Power doing stuff trying to stop the um, the vans going out or trying to stop the coaches going out or trying to prevent people getting to at different points when the deportation system occurs I would want to hold on to though something that what I'm talking about there is kind of kind of about strategy within within political organizing and I think um, you then related that slightly uh, to, to to being a researcher and to critique and while I don't want to say those things are totally separate I also find scholar activist a bit of an icky phrase and I don't embrace it myself particularly um, and I think it's okay for it's okay for it to be easier in some ways to do critique without compromise and to uh, you know use long words like we do and to try and think in, in utopian ways about and to use imagination and to um, and to not ha and to kind of defer the question of political politically compromising being strategic making reforms and, and that's okay that's part of what thinking should be about and what we need and then you bring that to hopefully you bring that together without a scholar activist badge on necessarily um, with people whether that's you with a different hat on or with other people into ideally a kind of shared project of trying to transform the world but I tend to see those things as, as slightly separate I tend to see the meeting about what we should do which reforms we should ask for which organizations we should work with whether there's any politicians we can petition or whether we should give up on that altogether and just try and um, prevent a, a you know a plane from going or whatever it is or whether we should just go and scream outside the home office again um, seems to me like that's a different set of questions in a different room to some of the questions about being a researcher and thinking about um, the kinds of questions we want to ask in rooms like this I don't want to hold them totally apart but I think it's okay for them to be they, they are in different registers and that's inevitable in some ways Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I just, uh, yeah, this is also very interesting and I, you know, I don't have also like a great, you know, uh, resolutive <laughs> contribution to make, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm wondering, thinking in my mind, I mean, you know, like one of the texts that I, that I love and, and, you know, often like uh, uh, after reading classes, Mari Matsuda's, you know, about the double con consciousness, right, where she says, 
oh, you know, we need, we need to be. Uh, oh no, she, she she talks about Angela Davis, and she and, and she says, Angela Davis, you know, one day she's uh, you know within the courtroom arguing about like you know a comma in a certain like uh, you know low and kind of really like in a technical way etc the next day is out of the courtroom like you know in a demonstration and kind of shouting you know like the whole legal system is corrupt we need to take this down and and you know burn this court etc right and and i do you know i i hear what you say i think it makes a lot of sense you know we need to think about these as two different spaces but i guess the question would be you know, I don't think it needs to be different people, right? Or, or on the contrary, I think you know we need to be able to move across the different registers, right? Uh, you know, this has problems as well, right? It's not like, you know, yeah, it's kind of it can be opportunistic and it can be, uh, yeah, let's say there, are, yeah, there are problems with that, of course. But I, I think there is also maybe a, a a way to do that that would be productive, and you know, one of the um, I remember. When I was uh, writing my PhD dissertation, in fact, I, you know, I was reading this interview with Sandro Mezzadra, you know, and there is this say, like saying in Italian operaism that goes, you know, it's about like being within and against, right? So this, you know, and Stefano Harney, I think, he takes him from there actually, like this this idea as well, and you know, he talks. So Sandro was talking about the protests in Italy against detention center in the you know early 2000, and so the the debate there was, you know. So the detention center were, you know, set up, and then there were a, a group of like, you know, activists were saying, well, we need to go in to see and monitor what's happening in there, right? And another group was saying, no, we need to, you know, take them down, right? And so there, there was this discussion, and you know, one of the ways in which they were thinking about that was this idea of the split temporality, right? So how can you, you know, claim in the same moment? that you want access to monitor and make sure that people are you know treated you know relatively fairly but also doing that you know while you do that you are also kind of you know claiming for this to be taken down right of course it's kind of you know it's an impossible proposition in a sense but somehow in that impossibility i find there is also something very productive and and evocative that we somehow need to keep together right or at, at least there's a kind of horizon right to, work through these questions. Can we check the time, sorry. <laughs> five, five, two. Five, two. Five, two. Perfect. Have we got questions in the audience? I don't think we have enough time for this, but we do. Or if, if not, we can go back to some more discussion. Jacob? Maybe it's like, that last question is like brilliant, but yeah, maybe just like put that back on on you, if that's bad, just like, what, what's the relationship between, you know, all your work is about like, really like granularly mapping the sort of like, mechanics of these systems, right, and how they operate, but how, how do you do that in a way that doesn't like, foreclose the possibility of like, just imagining them like totally otherwise? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I can start maybe, and then we can move down. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the reason that I brought that question up was because it was something I struggled with, like, so much while working on this and I think one of the main things that I tried to do like quite deliberately was like again for example Lorenzo brought up this example but I'm going to repeat it was like tech companies so some of the companies I was looking at like IBM Bay Systems a lot of these companies that are like really involved in like the really granular details of how a database works you know whether that's like through really tiny parts of that system like would put out these press releases or would release these like technical kind of guides being like and our system can do this and this and this and this and kind of trying not to say that like that try not to like lean on that understanding of like technology as this like thing that again if we make it better then it'll work better and like our borders will be fairer because we're using better technology so if the database like has the right amount or like the right information on the right people who like deserve to be deported like if that like that just isn't a claim that i i like ref like i refuse to like engage with that claim and i try to like think really otherwise about it and that was like something that I engaged in throughout the process of like writing my dissertation. But it was something that also came up when I was doing like interviews again with people who work in the migrant sector and like legal sector, um, and trying to like have conversations around you know someone who's working on like legal challenges to like yeah I mean deportations and things like that maybe has a different understanding of how the legal system works for immigration detainees and someone who works in like the data rights sector around migration because something that came up quite a lot was people who work in the intersection of those two things like thinking about data and migration, what came up a lot was like 
the data is the problem. Like we just have data and like all the wrong people, and we don't have the right like pathways to connect this part of the home office's like deportation apparatus, like this part of the home office's detention apparatus. And so that was something that came up quite a lot, and something that I like tried to resist in like the writing on the website, and something I tried to resist in like my investigative report, like not reproducing that idea of like the data is a problem, but like the the whole system is the problem. And so that was something that I think like on a discursive level I tried to do, just in terms of like the way that I wrote about my work or the way that I like speak about my work. Um, but I think it's something I still am gonna have to continue like thinking through quite actively, particularly in terms of like output, so like how to make the work public. So it doesn't come across as like a liberal kind of like it's a platform to like understand how data could be better to make like the home office work better, but like those things shouldn't exist and like understanding how these systems and assemblages are like, constructed is like one way to start to move towards like dismantling them all together. But yeah, that was, sorry, that was like really rambly, but I think we, we got there in the end. Yeah. Should we go down? Yeah. Um, I mean, kind of mirroring <laughs> a lot of what Sam just said, but it's the same like real battle for me that I've really had over the last two years is this like constant, it's not even like about whether it's right what I'm doing, but it's how to actually articulate to people when they ask me this question, like how to kind of express it, which is this balance, I guess, of recognising the like structural violence of the system, but then not shying away from zooming in to like, in my case, the bail hearing, which in the wider like kind of legal world is seen as this like insignificant event that like is constantly even with really amazing immigration lawyers like I honestly heard over and over again like why are you looking at bail you should look at the asylum hearings they're like way more dramatic on video link like bail is really procedural like it's they like I, I heard a lot of confusion about your whole research project is just on this bail hearing like it's it's just so procedural and kind of everyday like what what's the kind of research about basically and I feel like that tension is is kind of what I'm constantly trying to like um, balance which is even though a bail even if a bail hearing is granted like the moments of experiential violence in that hearing that like the detain the person detained experiences shouldn't just be overlooked like moments of like telephone breakage or when the interpreter like can't um, speak properly to the person they're trying to interpret or the denial of hearing or all these different moments that are everyday violences like are still just as important to be zoomed into while yeah recognizing the structural violence which I guess is kind of what you were saying Thomas earlier but um, it is yeah it's it's such a balance and attention that I, I feel like maybe the only way to constantly like work with it is to just always be thinking about it and talking about it every time we have something like this or um yeah <laughs> I don't know if that's clear but yeah. I think it's also maybe kind of a question of like how much do you scale out and like because we're so focused on like a track and the gap in the track and everything and then like taking a step back and actually looking at like something that I've been looking at a lot is like also the dichotomy of like Frontex saying that they're saving lives, right? So they would always say, like I think a few days ago they tweeted, oh, we saved 8,700 lives this year just with area surveillance or through our area surveillance. So also like how do you work with that and how do you encounter that? How do you, um, yeah, how do you argue basically against that? Because they're not saving lives, right? But um, that is what they say they are and then like how much do you take back because obviously Frontex is like a European Union agency and then like taking another step back is like I think yeah a bit difficult like in order to handle things and like still look at like the small scale and then the big scale again but yeah I think I think that just needs to happen basically that constantly zoom in and out in your own project I think um, I think that question of scale is really important, but one of the things that I think I've heard all of you talk about at some point or other is also like the temporality of these things, because you're all dealing with technical systems in some way, right? Like what's the, the latest technological fix for whatever the scenario is? And I think we can get sort of like interested in the particular violences that this new technological fix is producing. Um, but all of you at some point, you know, 
have talked about the sort of like longer history of these things, and I think always bringing that into to bear, like that temp temporal lens, because it's the insistence then that the current technology isn't the problem, you know, it's just the current manifestation of the problem, something mm -hmm. I think is what you've all done. Oh, I think that seems like a good note to leave it on. Thanks, Thomas. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for, for coming to the talk. And thank you so much, Lorenzo, Luke, and Thomas, for being such great respondents. I think we all learned a lot. And it's really exciting to know that there's still so much to do on our projects. Um, but yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Um, there's a screening later today, um, a reserve. I think it's on the program. There are some more events happening this weekend. I think tomorrow there's a couple more workshops and screenings. And also, today is Thomas's birthday. <laughs> 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 Wish him a happy birthday when you see him. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> No, it's fine. I'm going to have a drink with a friend. So Perfect. So there you go. Perfect timing. I never come down. <laughs> we actually have something. So these are some of our publications that we've put together. So this is the degree show. There's like a program. And then we've got some of these together for the award this year. Oh, wow. Which, yeah. And it's just... Yeah, basically like a year long. I was like, 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 I <laughs> wow. Also, I must just say, this is like such a basic one. As someone who is not big or techie, like, that doesn't look this worse. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's great. It's like, what do we do? I say, is there some kind of reason? I think it's like a basic one. I think it's like a basic one. I think it's like a basic one.